Hi, I'm Justin Guest, a doctoral student here in the Government Department at the LSE. Welcome to the newest edition of The Hot Seat. With us today is John Chalcraft, a lecturer here at the LSE in the history of empire and imperialism. And he's here to discuss the aftermath of the Gaza conflict that has been occupying headlines for the last month. Thank you very much for being here. Do you think that this conflict in Gaza has changed the power dynamic between Hamas and Fatah in Palestine in the eyes of the Palestinians? Well, it's a bit too early to say, you see, because to some extent Mahmoud Abbas had to register some kind of solidarity with Palestinians under fire in Gaza. But it was a rather weak and tenuous kind of set of remarks which didn't please the population in either the West Bank, the occupied West Bank or the Gaza Strip or, you know, East Jerusalem. Uh, and on the other hand... Uh, you know, the split between Hamas and Fatah has been very significant, very serious since, you know, 2005-06. But the truth is that neither party is especially popular now among ordinary Palestinians in the occupied territories. And this has been the case since the collapse of the Oslo process, when the Israelis walked away from the negotiating table in February 2001 in Taba, when it did seem that there were some of the outlines of a two-state solution but which were, you know, crashed on the rocks of Israeli intransigence because they wouldn't remove the settlements. They wouldn't, uh, they persisted in trying to create a Palestine that was a series of non-continuous enclaves ruled over not by a sovereign government but by an interim self-governing authority but that might enjoy the symbols of sovereignty. And for all sorts of, Israel wanted to control the borders the security, the water, the airspace, and of course it would do nothing but tokenism on either Jerusalem or the right of return. So there was no real two-state solution uh, by 2001. It, and this demobilized the Palestinian population because they were behind the two-state solution. Chairman Arafat's, you know, his dream was to be the president of an independent Palestine, even if it was to be on only 22% of the territory of the historic mandate. He was willing to make that compromise as the PLO signed up to it in 1988 at the Algiers. And then, and through the Oslo process, this was the general idea. But it foundered because Israel was not willing to accept an independent Palestine next to it. And so what we have now is the sort of politically bankrupt aftermath of the collapse of, you know, at least a potential two-state solution. You know, a two-state solution which the international community since 1967, through every General Assembly resolution uh, and, more, and, and you know, a number of UN Security Council resolutions, says is you know, what it regards as you know, one kind of settlement to this very long-standing, very you know, intractable and destabilizing conflict, not just in the Middle East, but for the rest of us. So, uh, and this is the aftermath of, of that. And, 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 and the fact is that, yeah, Hamas were elected democratically in 2005, and, uh, you know, this, uh, but nonetheless, this, the response that the EU and, and the US gave to this was to put them under siege. And, uh, but nonetheless, in spite of that, you know, the, the, pop, the Palestinian population is not that mobilized politically because it's, you know, it's been fragmented geographically and it doesn't necessarily see either Hamas or Fatah. I mean, Fatah in many ways has been criticized for being corrupt. Hamas... Uh, although far less corrupt, you know, it's not clear to people that it, it, it can deliver. But as we know, they've, you know, renounced uh, 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 suicide bombings and they, you know, have already moved to a more sort of practical position, as it were, since coming to power. But, uh, you know, they're not necessarily uh, enormously popular, the, but the Palestinian population is not that mobilized. So in light of what you say, what prospects remain for the Palestinian-Israeli peace process now? Well, the outlook is rather bleak uh, because, you know, this whole idea of a peace process, I mean, there were negotiations uh, between Israel and the PLO, which began in the Madrid conference in 1991 and went on till 2001. There were negotiations. Uh, Israel never recognized Palestine as a nation. And what, and in the text of the Oslo Accords, you have the idea that there would be an interim self-governing authority. But this was a negotiated process, and it seemed as if Arafat was willing to make all sorts of compromises on settlements and security and borders and water and airspace and this kind of thing. 
That's what it looked like. And so there were negotiations, but they finished in 2001. And I mean, uh, so there, there's been no peace process since 2001. There's been a series, there's been no negotiations. There's been some security cooperation with, you know, the Quisling government of Mahmoud Abbas. Uh, but, the, and, but there's been no, you know, meaningful negotiations over what a future political settlement would look like. And this was the point of Ariel Sharon's unilateral withdrawal from the Gaza Strip, as Dove Weisglass, his, you know, his um, chief of staff, reported, and it was published in Haaretz, you know, the leading Israeli daily newspaper, that the idea, the object behind this unilateral withdrawal was to freeze the diplomatic process. And in that it was quite successful. And, you know, and this is, and I think this is what, People are beginning to realize, you know, in a more salutary sort of way in Britain, in, in, in the West more generally, that there has that there's a, a bankruptcy over the political process. There's certainly a bankruptcy uh, in regard to Israeli policies, you know, towards uh, the Palestinians. And, and you know, a massacre of a captive civilian population living in what's become an open-air prison is uh, you know emblematic of that of that bankruptcy, and I you know and it's interesting for the first time uh, that I remember there's been reportage of Palestinian civilian suffering in quite large numbers since the end of the conflict, since the ceasefire, because some reporters went in from the Daily Telegraph, the Guardian, the Independent, and the, the, the Monday after the ceasefire, the papers from top to bottom were filled with images and pictures and stories of which made it clear that there was a traumatized, uh, homeless, injured, you know, civilian population which didn't have access to food, water, aid because of the Israeli stranglehold on the Gaza Strip, which it still hasn't lifted. And the whole, the bankruptcy of this, as, you know, if you're talking about 1.5 million people in an open-air prison where, you know, they can't get out, there's, you know... uh, is I think, you know, it's to some degree uh, hit home to some of the reading public in this country. And that's why you have uh, things like student occupations of campuses, which is, you know, this hasn't been seen in Britain since the 1980s, since the struggle against apartheid in South Africa. Uh, and, and on and on. The, the protest against the BBC decision, this, you know, inhumane decision to say, that there is no humanitarian crisis in Gaza, which is effectively what it means to say we won't broadcast an appeal, you know, even though there's women and children who don't have access to food, water and medicine because the Israelis aren't letting it in. We can't say, we can't make an appeal that's humanitarian on this basis from a whole series of leading charities and a respected, you know, disaster emergency committee. And, uh, but, the, but the Manchester offices of the BBC were occupied. Uh, in protest against this, and then and you have you know, 16, 17, 18 campuses across the country that have been occupied, and uh, and you have these demonstrations and and calls for boycott, divestment, and sanctions, which are quite you know, significant from the point of view of Western civil society. So, yeah, I think that political bankruptcy of the Israeli position is starting to you know is starting to be understood better. All right. So now, if we sort of broaden the lens a bit and we try to get in the regional context. We know that you know, Hezbollah has sent in some rockets into the northern Israeli highlands. Uh, we know that there's been some saber rattling uh, by the Saudis and some others in the region. What have we learned from this conflict about the Middle East relationship with the peace process and with Israel? Well, I don't think it's true that Hezbollah fired those rockets. I think it was, you know, it's not clear they deny fly, uh, firing the rockets. I think it was some dissident uh, faction or other. Uh, well... You know, the Arab world started out by being largely silent, failed to condemn the, you know, this first day one, 27th of December, the Israelis launched this massive series of airstrikes. More than 200 people are killed. They, you know, uh, they bomb the graduation ceremony of a police academy. You know, police by, under international law, of course, are civilians. They're not combatants or, you know, members of the military. Uh, and the Arab world stayed silent. It only started to say things with the ground invasion. Uh, but even then, it was limited. I mean, what it, sh- it, puts, it just puts a tremendous distance, a further distance between those Arab leaderships and their own populations because the populations are, uh, uh, you know, extraordinarily emphatic in their opposition to what Israel's done. 
And the Arab leaderships, again, look tremendously ineffective in their ability to do anything about it. And, um, but the fact that, and, 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 and so, you know, it, Egypt, Israel, uh, uh, you know, Egypt's effectively been cooperating with Israel in, in this whole business. So uh, it's not a very edifying picture. It increases the, the frustration felt among significant sections of the Arab public. It does nothing to burnish the image of those Arab leaders. And it doesn't, it doesn't move forward the, the, the real uh, uh, prospects for peace, normalization, and a comprehensive settlement between Israel and those Arab states because it generates you know, all these you know, negative uh, you know, for, feelings and opposition. All right, Dr. Childcraft, thank you very much for being here. You are off the hot seat officially. If you want to hear more from uh, Dr. Childcraft and his thoughts, uh, he has a new book out called The Invisible Cage, Syrian Migrant Workers in Lebanon. It's been published just a couple months ago and out in bookstores now. Uh, as for us, that'll do it for this edition of The Hot Seat. Please tune in next month for yet another edition on yet another newsworthy topic. Thanks very much.